day and welcome to the NEI Communications Briefing Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At the time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Steve Karekas. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, we'll have uh, available to you today uh, three speakers from different uh, disciplines here at NEI. Uh, first, you'll hear from uh, Tony Petrangelo, our Senior Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer. That's P I E T. R-A-N-G-E-L-O. Also, Alex Flint, our Senior Vice President for Governmental Affairs. F-L-I-N-T is the spelling on that. And uh, Ralph Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N. -E -E Ralph is our Senior Director for Radiation Safety and Environmental Protection. Tony and Alex are, have uh, brief opening <coughs> remarks to make to you, and then we'll uh, take your questions. Uh, due to uh, just pressing schedules, we do need to limit the length of today's call to uh, 30 minutes. Thanks for participating. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Tony Petrangelo speaking. Um, even though the full extent of uh, the damage to the Fukushima reactors is, is unknown and it's going to take a long time to uh, fully understand what has transpired over the last week and whatever time uh, uh, going forward, uh, the events there represent a significant talent, a challenge to the structural integrity and safety of the plant. As more is learned from these events, we will develop more uh, corrective actions here in the U.S. Uh, this week, uh, the chief nuclear officers representing all 104 units in the U.S. conferred and agreed to take the following actions at their sites. Uh, there's four. Number one, verify each company's capability to mitigate conditions that re result from severe accidents including the loss of significant operational and safety systems due to natural events, fires, aircraft impact, and explosions. Two, verify that the capability to mitigate a total loss of electric power to a nuclear power plant is proper and functional. Three, verify the capability to mitigate flooding and the impact of floods on systems inside and outside the plant with a particular focus on ensuring that materials and equipment are properly located to protect them from flood and four, to perform walk-downs and inspections of important equipment needed to successfully, successfully respond to fire and flood events. Again, these are the actions we're taking now. Uh, we have shared these actions with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, we will go forward with these, and as we learn more from the events in Japan and fully understand them, I'm sure ad additional lessons learned will be applied. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Alex Flint. It's Alex Flint. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what we're doing in government affairs space. Uh, since Saturday morning, NEI has been going 24 hours a day with a group doing an analysis of the situation in Japan. As we've been able to understand what occur has occurred there, we are pushing that information out to as many places as we can in Washington. We're updating the NEI.org website, which has a dedicated page to, to the situation there. And then we have been we're distributing electronically to thousands of congressional staffers and administration officials, but then also hosting briefings. We have briefed hundreds of congressional staff. We have briefed tens of uh, members of Congress. Uh, over 50 members of Congress have been briefed by us. Uh, we are also working with other groups here in town, the National Governors Associations and others, to keep them fully informed. Now, our objective is simply to ensure that policymakers understand the facts as we understand them, so that as they come to conclusions and then decide what policies they want to affect, they will be doing so based upon uh, the best knowledge that we have. Uh, we have, uh, to date, I will observe that almost all of the questions that we have gotten have been about the Japanese situation. Uh, the Congress has taken a few steps. Uh, there was certainly with Secretary Chu and Chairman Yatsko before the House Energy and Commerce Committee yesterday. There were a lot of questions there. And then the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee held a briefing yesterday that Tony Petrangelo appeared at. There was a lot of discussion there about Japan, but also some discussion about plants in the U.S. And we are, so we are also prepared to answer any questions that members of Congress or the administration have in that regard. And with that, I'm ready to take questions if we want to go go do that. We're ready. All right, everyone, if you want to ask a question, just press star and then one in your touchstone telephone at this time. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure that your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Once again, that is star and then one to ask a question. We'll go first to Peter Bear with Climate Wire. 
um, Ken Hall, and uh, thanks again for your briefings. The Union of Concerned Scientists uh, has put out a report that focuses on uh, safety of the uh, U.S. Uh, licensees, and uh, it shows there's a variation in uh, performance uh, around the regions and uh, between among the companies. So my question is, um, does the info process and your insights reveal any significant uh, differences in, in management commitment to safety and safety culture? Uh, and if so, uh, how is that addressed? Yeah, let me say one, I haven't read the UCS report. This is Tony. Um, let me explain further the focus of the industry actions. Uh, primarily, the NRC's regulations are predicated on design basis events, and we have surveillances in place, procedures in place, specifically designed to demonstrate that the plants can be shut down safely in the event of any or multiple of multiples of those design basis events. So on a regular basis, we're routinely inspected by the NRC uh, against that criteria. Uh, what the chief nuclear officers agreed to do this week was to focus more on beyond design basis events, beyond what they're currently doing for design basis, because based on at least the initial insight we're getting from the Fukushima uh, events is that these were beyond design basis occurrences. And so we're focusing on actions that some we put in place uh, as a result of work we did after September 11th, others we put in place uh, with severe accident management guidelines that have really been uh, instituted in the industry since beginning in the late 80s and through the 90s. Um, so that's what we're focusing on in these initial set of actions. Okay, uh, Mike, my, my question had to do with whether you'd seen uh, differences among the licensees in management uh, commitment to uh, a safety culture, and if so, uh, how is that addressed within the industry? We have not seen that difference. We, we just passed an initiative in the fall with respect to safety culture for a common assessment process to be put in place. But the NRC uses the reactor oversight process to allocate its resources across the 104 units. Uh, and we participate in monthly discussions with them on the results of that oversight. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Tom Henry with the Toledo Blade. Yeah, if, if the NRC is now uh, urging all Americans in Japan uh, uh, to get at least 50 miles away from the site of these uh, reactors, how could it not do the same thing in the United States? And would that, will that make the 10-mile evacuation zone obsolete? Will it become a 50-mile evacuation zone? And how does that effect, although that's an emergency planning issue, uh, you know, what effect uh, would that have on the industry? Yes, uh, this is Ralph Anderson. Uh, let me answer that in two parts. Uh, it, certainly we're all aware of the uh, recommendations that were made by the White House yesterday for uh, U.S. citizens to remain beyond 50 miles from the Fukushima plant. Uh, it's our understanding uh, from our what we've seen uh, from the NRC and actually some uh, informal discussions we've had with them that those recommendations take into account some very preliminary uh, evaluations of the situation at Fukushima uh, in essence preliminary highly conservative uh, evaluations uh, with a very limited set of information which has been an issue throughout uh, and so that uh, that, that provides the rationale for why uh, such, a, a, such a recommendation would be made. Uh, the chairman of the NRC in uh, discussing this with the Congress uh, made clear that in effect this, this is reflected in the current framework that we have for emergency preparedness and protection in the U.S. And that is because uh, although uh, as many folks are aware we have a uh, a base planning zone of 10 miles for conducting evacuations around plants and 50 miles uh, for actions such as interdicting food or water supplies in the event of, of radioactivity releases. Uh, it, it's always been built within our plans that we would have an expanded capability for evacu evacuation if that became necessary. However, the, uh, the 10 mile planning zone really was based on a very robust assessment of potential accidents and potential offsite consequences 
and we don't see any information from the current events that that invalidates that uh, nor are we aware that the NRC at this point has any intention of of changing our fundamental framework for emergency preparedness and 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 protection. But yes, but yeah, you're an industry that prides itself on redundancy. And, I mean, you, you said this is highly conservative. Uh, you don't know all the information, and, and granted, you know this may be ultimately shown to be a highly conservative. But as a layman, people would be asking, why aren't we getting in the United States the same highly conservative? Uh, redundancy, if it, even if it is redundant, in safety, uh, because if you go to 50 miles, that would change the, the you know, from, from many places around the country, I'm sure, including here in Toledo, that immediately puts us in the evacuation zone of two nuclear plants. Right. Uh, I guess I'll come back to the point that uh, given the extraordinary circumstances that are, are at Fukushima, and given to uh, the fact of uh, very preliminary and incomplete information, uh, NRC appears to have made certain assumptions that were then captured in a decision to remove a relatively small number of U.S. citizens from that 50-mile zone. I don't see that in contradiction at all uh, to a major decision that has not been made by the Japanese, for example, to evacuate large populations with all of the risks that that entails, uh, given the prognosis for radiological consequences. And that's, that's pretty much where, where we sit today. It's an understanding of the potential consequences versus large population evacuations versus a relatively simple to implement decision for a small number of citizens to get on airplanes and fly home or go stay in a different city. Next up, we'll hear from Jim Paulson with the Bloomberg News. Uh, yes, uh, Tony, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on what sorts of things, how the chief nuclear officer is going to be looking beyond uh, the design specifications uh, as they go through this review. Yeah, as I said before, um, we've conducted extensive probabilistic safety assessments at our plants. That the, the way that plants are licensed to these design basis events, what each licensee must demonstrate in the licensing process is given a, a single or series of these, I'll call them worst case scenarios, for example, uh, seismic event with the double-ended guillotine break of the largest pipe in the reactor coolant system, show me you can shut the plant down, okay? That's what we're licensed on. But that's predicated on you can safely shut the plant down in such circumstances, i.e., you don't have any core damage. What probabilistic risk analysis does is look at sequences of human interactions, equipment malfunctions, natural events, etc., and looks at it in a very comprehensive way across the plant to see sequences where you could, in fact, uh, incur core damage. That both identifies vulnerability, potential vulnerabilities in the design and operation of the facility, which we can address, as well as accident management insights, which we can incorporate into our operational procedures and, and post-accident procedures. So that's really the part that we're focusing on for this, because the whole day-to-day -day structure at the plant, for the most part, is predicated on the design basis events. And we're going beyond that in this initial look. Um, design basis in, in the sense of things that could go wrong or design basis in terms of uh, natural disasters. Let's say a 8.9 magnitude earthquake in California instead of the 7 to 7.5 that is the design basis for those plants. Both. It's both the, the initiating natural phenomena as well as what you need to assume would fail in the plant, and then demonstrate that you can shut the plant down safely. 